Thank you very much, Gianluca. Yeah, indeed, I'm very proud of being a former MLG uh, members on leash today. Um, so yeah, interrupt me as much as you can so I can justify using the full hour for my slides. Uh, today, it's going to be very little about machine learning, to your biggest disappointment, I guess. But it's going to be a funny story about how you can mess up with your career. So, uh, can you switch off the light? Maybe? Uh, yeah. So the title is Open Data Science for Biomarker Discovery in Precision Medicine. So I'm working in a big cancer center. So the idea is that we want to uh, improve disease management, and I'll, I'll explain why I mean uh, what I mean by uh, uh, biomarker discovery. Okay. So as you may know, in biomedical uh, sciences, we we kind of have uh, a, a crisis of for for reproducibility. A, a lot of papers didn't show up to be uh, 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 reproducible and, and that means even nature science cell papers, actually especially nature cell science paper, uh, they have a big problem with reproducibility and I'm sure you know the, the work from uh, John Hot, you know, I know this, uh, who basically uh, screened the whole literature and, and showed that uh, many of the findings are just plain wrong due to either um, bad statistical approaches, bad data or sometimes even misconduct. Uh, maybe you know those two, uh, those two uh, uh, guys, uh, Kevin Kumbes and Keith Bargerly. I, I call them the, the Robin Hoods of, of bioinformatics because they actually dive very deep into some papers and, and proved uh, and found evidence of, of misconduct. And, and the problem with those papers is that they, they were both they were using the findings in clinical trials. So at the end of the day, this is not just about science, it's about the patients as well, and that was pretty bad. And, and again, in, in biomedical science or preclinical research, there is also a lot of crisis because we use model systems that we bi badly, uh, wrongly characterize. Like we use a cell line that we think is a breast cancer cell line, but actually it's a skin cell line. And, and obviously your conclusion would be slightly different if you knew that uh, the real tissue types of those cell lines. So that's for the reproducibility crisis. If you, if you think about data sharing, uh, data sharing has a big role to play. In this, in this reproducibility uh, 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 thing. Um, so why data are so precious? Uh, they are very expensive to, to generate. The, the amount of samples are very limited. We have very limited uh, resources at the end of the day. Uh, I would say that only economists could believe that we have infinite number of, of data and, and resources. So it's very important to share. Each data is extremely valuable and unique in many ways. And the, the benefit, the benefits of reproducibility is really you try to replicate the experiment. That's that's really the the the, ba the baseline, the basic level. Then you try to reproduce it. You try to see whether taking another data set would would basically reach the same conclusion. Then sometimes you want to reuse. You want to use a method that has been used in cancer X, apply it to cancer Y, or maybe take a, a method that is used in gen engineering for the last 50 years and try it uh, on genomics data. And something I find very, very interesting is that data, if you share data, it actually is, gonna, is going to facilitate post-publication peer review. When you publish a paper, a lot of people think that's the end of it. You publish your nature paper and you switch to another topic. But actually, I believe this is only the beginning. You basically convince three biased reviewers that your work is awesome. And then you have the full community, and then you release it to the full community, and usually people think it's over, but that's really where the fun begins, when all the people look at your publication and scrutinize your code or methods or data, and, and sometimes they come up with opposite conclusions. Okay, so let's go back to my topic, biomarker discovery. So for those working in cancer research, um, it's, we, we, have, we, have been developed, we have been developing a lot of, of targeted therapies, meaning that we have drugs that can target specific aspects of the cancer like proliferation, immune invasion, tumor inv uh, immu yeah, immu uh, uh, sorry, immune escape, tumor invasion. So we're, we have been pretty good in the, in the last uh, a few decades to define what makes a, a, a cancer a cancer and how to target each specific aspect. And of course, you have drugs that kills everything that proliferate too much, like chemotherapy. They're not very targeted. Uh, you, you lose your hair because the, those cells proliferate a lot, but hopefully you kill the cancer as much. As, as the normal uh, highly proliferative cells. So we have all this bunch of, of drugs. But, so you would say, well, we could cure cancer, but that's not 
as easy. Actually, the problem is that each drug is efficient in only a very small portion of the patients. So we need what we call drug companion tests. We need a model that can tell us whether a given patient, given the molecular features of the tumor of that patient, uh, whether that patient will, will respond to the drug and hopefully will not have a recurrence uh, or, or, or death even. Um, so the problem is that drugs are extremely costly to, to uh, develop and we see a drop in, in drugs being approved by the FDA, which basically means that all the low hanging fruits, all the easy targets, we have found them in the last, in the last um, 100 years, I would say. But know that we are looking for, for signals that are much more subtle. Uh, it's very hard to, to target those, those subtle signals. So now we get less and less drugs. So basically, the, the, the thing is that we have to leverage what we have already. And the idea of companion tests is that you, you take a piece of tumor, you try to understand all the molecular features of that tumor. It could be a mutation, a gene fusion, some methylation patterns, some gene expression patterns, <coughs> or proteomic uh, expression as well. And you try to build a model that can basically inform the clinicians saying that, oh, that patient will respond or that patient will not respond. And then you can decide which drug is more likely to work. So this is what we call biomarker. So you, you have a, a set of features, usually one, but you can have more. You have a univariate or multivariate predictors based on those features, and you try to predict the, the response of the patient. And that starts usually by generating a lot of data in the lab, in very simple model systems like cancer cell lines, cells growing in a dish, or a mouse, or even tumor human tumor, tumors growing in, a mi in mice. Uh, so you generate those data and then there is what we call preclinical studies where you try to understand the relationship between the signs that respond to the drug versus the signs that did not that did not respond. And those models are, 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 are very um, those model systems, these cell lines are actually pretty simple to, to work with. So so basically this is where a lot of work is done to try to understand what is the molecular feature that will help you um, predict uh, the response, uh, the response of the patient. So, what people did nowadays, very recently, actually, the last uh, four years, they they had an insanely large collection of cell lines, and the idea is to represent the molecular diversity of cancer. So, if you have only one cell line, that usually that cell line is a bit messed up. There is a lot of chromosome, chromosomal duplication and stuff like that. It's growing in addition to very rich media, so it doesn't really represent the patient. But if you have only one you're very unlikely to find anything relevant for the patient. If you have a thousand, then suddenly you will have an, some instances of, of mutations or epigenetic events that you find in the patient. So what they do, they have these large, like almost a thousand cancer cell lines. They grow them, they profile them for any kind of genomics data you can imagine. Mutation, expression, protein expression, and so on. Um, and then what they do, and that's, that's a very interesting part that's kind of novel, that was novel for me five years ago, is that they try, they, they test different concentration of the drug and they see whether the cell line responds. So here you have drug concentration. So imagine that in log scale you have several increments. And then you have the percentage viability of the cells in, in, the, in the dish. And if you have a drug that does nothing, you, you've got a flat line. The cell lines grow as well when you treat them with a drug versus the control where, where you don't treat them with anything. It's just, it's called DMA, so it's just a placebo, if you wish. In, for that cell lines, on the other hand, you can see that if you increase the concentration, the percentage of, viability, of viable cells is diminishing, is decreasing. So in that case, the, the green would be a drug that does nothing. And we say that the cell line is resistant to that drug because it doesn't, the cell line doesn't care, really. And the purple line is an example of of drug with some kind of some kind of response, so the cell line would be sensitive to that drug. And if you look at the literature, there is a bunch of markers that have been approved and are being used in the clinic, and they usually either mutation, like BRAF mutation, to for the response to um, in melanoma to to a, to a BRAF inhibitor, or you have ERBB2 expression for herceptin in breast cancer. It's usually a single gene where they found this very, very strong association. It's not always the drug target. That's the funny thing. A drug is targeting a gene, but sometimes it's not that gene that's the best biomarker. It's another gene that controls that gene, for instance. 
So situation can get very complex. And there is a few multivariate biomarkers, meaning that it took several features together and build a multivariate predictive model. But those are very rare because they're, they're extremely hard to develop, to validate, and to get the, vali the, to get the approval from the FDA. So why do we need more biomarkers? As I said, we got tons of drugs, but only a small subset of patients will actually uh, respond to those drugs. Most of, of the biomarkers are univariate, so we would like to, to go for multivariate. Why? Because the current biomarkers kind of suck, honestly. They don't work very well, so we need to increase the complexity of the model. But on the other hand, it's, it's a very complex issue. We need a lot of sample size, good quality data, and so on. So what kind of data do you want to use for biomarker discovery? I already told you that we use a lot of the cell lines, but actually there is a, a spectrum. You could use patient data. If you have an approved drugs and you have a clinical trials, you could get like, I don't know, a few hundred patients. Some people will respond, some will not, and then you use that data set. But it's usually very limited in size, and it works only for approved therapies. You cannot really give random toxic compounds to people. Um, this is a very interesting new model that, that is being used more and more at Princess Margaret, where we basically use mouse models. We take a piece of tumor, we let the tumor grow in a mouse model, so you have a human tumor growing in a mouse host. So this is not high throughput, you cannot test thousands of drugs, um, but you can, it's, it's cool because the tumor is really growing in vivo. But those mice are immunodeficient, so it doesn't work for immunotherapy very well. Um, so again, might be the best model for tumor response, uh, but it's very expensive and it's still low throughput. So what people do is usually use cell lines because then you can use robots. You can screen a thousand, like fifty thousand compounds, drugs on, on on a thousand drugs. It's totally feasible. The problem is that those cell lines have been derived sometimes fifty years ago. The first cell lines has been derived like sixty years ago, I think. And along the years, they acquired tons and tons of additional mutations, chromosomes, so they completely messed up. So they don't really look like real tumors anymore, but they're still living organisms that come from a cancer. So they're still relevant somehow. Um, so there is a lot of, there is a very long history of data sharing in what we call pharmacogenomics, where you have pharmacological data, this drug dose response curve, and the genomic data. And as you can see, it started in, in 97 by the NCI. They screened a very small subset of, a, a very small set of cell lines, but along the years, they accumulated uh, response to more than 60,000 drugs. So it's, it's pretty amazing what they've done. And you can imagine over, over 20 years, they accumulated a lot of batch effects and they changed the platform several times. So it's a bit of a mess, but it's still a very valuable data set. Japan tried to do the same thing, and then pharmaco company like GlaxoSmithKline or Pfizer started to, to, to get involved in that game because they designed the drug. They also want to have the good uh, model to develop biomarkers. And then you have those two seminal studies uh, that have been published in March, uh, in March 2012 in the same issue of Nature, where they basically had almost a thousand cell lines and they tested a bunch of drugs on them. So that, those were the first very, very large panel of cell lines that they were claiming in their paper that was such a big sample size and diversity, they would be able to design biomarkers that could be applicable to the patients. And then people start continued that, 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 that game somehow, and, and the data set got bigger and bigger, and CTRPV2 is huge, 800 cell lines with 400 drugs, and then the new paper just published a few weeks ago with 1,000 cell lines and almost 300 drugs. So, it's, it's a very hot field where new data are getting generated almost every month. So with this plethora of data, you could choose to focus on the best data set, the one you like very much or the one you have access to, but somehow you have these large collections. So why would you combine any of, your, of these data sets? Obviously, sample size is a big issue. There is a lot of biological variability. You'll see about the technical variability. So you want to increase the sample size to build better models. You also want to use independent data set to train and validate your model. So it's very, it's very interesting uh, from a validation perspective. So I, yep. I have a question. When they are testing drugs, they are testing one drug at a time or yes. they are testing also combination drugs? So the combination data that are coming out now, okay. uh, one so from America. Uh, yeah, for the moment, all my talk is going to be about monotherapy, um, but we are now working on combination therapies, but as you can imagine, the number of drugs uh, of, of combination is exploding. Uh, sometimes it has more than two, so it, it's kind of it's getting crazy. 
So when we saw those data set in 2012, we got very excited because for the first time we could validate, we could train a classifier and validate it on, on two large data sets. So that's what we did basically in, in uh, with two summer students in my lab. Um, it was actually a lot of fun. So we took one data set, we did some cross validation in that data set. I'll show you the different methods we used. It's not, it's not, not very fancy. So we got for some drug, we use only gene expression. That's a big limitation of the study. Uh, for some drugs, we first looked at the cross validation to see whether some biomarkers seems to be interesting, promising. Then we took those biomarkers and we test them in CCLA, which is the completely independent, uh, completely independent data set. And then we saw that basically there were, we could split that data set into two parts. The cell lines that were already in the training set, that's supposed to be a very easy task because you already saw the cell lines in the training set. It's just a biological replicate, so the model should be almost perfect in that sense, in that situation. And then you have a bunch of cell lines that have not been used in the training set. So there you test the generalization uh, uh, power of the model, which is uh, the biological generalization power of the model, which is, which is much more challenging. So we, we used a couple of methods. We didn't want to get very fancy because the data were already complex enough. So we didn't want to uh, uh, disturb the reviewers with fancy methods. So I like this one. You just take the single gene that's the most correlated between the gene expression values across the cell line and the drug sensitivity across the cell lines. So just a simple correlation test. We use Spearman, nothing really fancy. Here, you do the same thing, but you take the top 30 and you combine all the univariate predictors in an ensemble framework. Uh, no big deal. Here, again, you take the top 30, you build a, a univariate model without parentization. Um, here, we use the uh, maximum, uh, minimum redundancy, maximum relevance uh, feature selection to try to in increase the, the amount of information uh, in the model. And then we use elastic net with, with using uh, some kind of regularization to do uh, some embedded feature selection. So nothing really fancy. Yep. Regression problem? You yeah, it's a regression gene? problem. So you have a continuous gene expression, yeah. and then you have the but drugs. Not the, the, the curve you oh yeah, the you're right. I forgot to say something about the curve. So people um, summarize yeah. those curves in multiple ways. So the pharmacologists will take what they call the IC50s, the concentration you need to kill 50% of the cells. The problem with IC50 is that it's, it's not defined most of the time because the curve never crossed the 50% or you have to extrapolate, which is pretty dangerous. So what we did, and a lot of people uh, do that now as well, is that we just take the area under the curve. So here, if the area is 1, it means that the drug does nothing. If the area is very low, it's killing a lot of the cells. So it's the not... Trend, you don't consider, I mean, you suppose that the trend you know, is decreasing. Yeah. So we, we make a lot of assumptions to fit those curves. And this is by, by no way perfect. Uh, there is a lot of data in those curves that nobody leverages right now. Um, but yeah, so we are working now in, in, uh, in trying to fit multiple parameters and, and predict all those parameters at once in, in multiple input, multiple output kind of regression problem. But for this kind of work, we wanted to, to be in line with what people did in the literature. So we summarized it summarize those curves with a single uh, value. So what we observe is that for some drugs we got a very nice signal. So this is a concurrence index. It's a, it's a generalization around the um, uh, generalization for the rock curve uh, of the area under the rock curve. So um, 0 0.5 is the random case. So where is 0 0.5 here? And we consider 65 to be decent. It's not great, but it's a decent uh, uh, pred predictive ability for the model. So here we found a bunch of drugs that seems to be uh, um, um, kind of for which we can build multivariate models. And I like this one because the single gene is actually already pretty good. So for that drug, we, we found a single gene that can predict the response pretty well. Um, why I focus on that one? Because that's the only single gene that validated. But here you, you can see that a single gene works well, and this is here BB2. Uh, which is the non-biomarker for lapatinib, so it means that we didn't mess up with the data. This is a MEK inhibitor, so I don't even remember that gene because it didn't validate. And this is NQ1, which metabolizes the drug into its active form. So it, it kind of made sense. So we got all the green models that we consider to be promising. Then we went to um, 
the validation set and we got something like this. So it's basically a total failure. Uh, we looked back at the data or at, at the code and we tried to, to, we were hoping to find a bug or something. There might still be a bug, but we didn't find them. Uh, so my, my point is that except maybe for that drug, uh, here, you see the single gene, pretty awesome. Uh, here there is one model, two models that seem to shine, but for the rest it was very, very disappointing. And those were the cell lines that were in common with the training set. So it's just biological replicated. There is nothing new from a biological point of view. We saw that biology in the training set. So we're very disappointed. Then we did the same thing for the new cell lines and unsurprisingly we didn't really uh, manage to get better performance. Again, only that superb single gene thing, right? So here, lapatinib, where is lapatinib? Here. That gene is supposed to work very well. So that's a bit disturbing. So, so we basically published a paper saying that it was not that bad, even though it was very bad. But they bought it. So uh, we even tried fancier machine learning method. And uh, here you should see a plot. But um, basically, we, we did some kind of ensemble MRMR feature selection. We were thinking that maybe a single feature selection is not enough. We could have a population of solutions. It helped for a few drugs. but. Uh, not not really great. So we published that that paper there uh, in 2013. But the funny thing is that people were basically a lot of people were doing the same thing. So in 2014, Adam Margolin, who was actually uh, funny enough, he's part of the CCLE study, published another paper where he tested like 200,000 models with tons of different parameters tuning, and he found basically the same thing. It was very very hard to validate, try and validate in, in another data. Set. And then a bunch of other publications that reached the same conclusion. So at least we were not completely wrong. It looks like it's really, really difficult uh, to, to play that game, to use a data set and validate in another data set. And then we, we start looking at the data themselves. Instead of you know, trying to find a bug in your code or trying more machine learning methods, we decided to look at the data really and, and, and try to assess the feasibility of, of the task. And what we found was actually for us very very surprising. You will see some plots but the, the basic conclusion is that the drug sensitivity data, those drug dose response curves, they were very very different. So for the same cell lines or the same drug, a data set would say super resistant and another data set would say super sensitive. So obviously if you build any machine learning predictive model or if you, if you build any predictive models the model cannot really change its mind. If you saw that, if if it saw that cell line before being resistant, it cannot really say cell line sensitive. So we published that paper. Oops. And and you can summarize the paper in a few figures. So those are the AUC, this area under the drug dose response curve, as published by the studies. And each point is a cell line for a given drug. So this point, for instance, or let's say this point, for instance has exactly the same value between the two studies. So that cell line treated for, by that drug in the two studies reach exactly the same AUC. Very good news. All the points should be on the diagonal. But you can see that many times the correlation or, or the, 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 the scatter plus is actually pretty messy. This one being the worst. There is almost no correlation between the two studies. Even so, those are the same cell lines treated, treated with the same drugs. So I'll, I'll point out a few observations here. So here you see that the drug has, has a very large effect. You see a lot of cell lines being, having a lot of different AUC. Here you can see that the drug has very little effect. Most of the cell lines are actually resistant except a few cases. And that's going to be important for the rest of the talk. But the bottom line is we saw those plots and we say, damn, we're in trouble. We're never going to be able to really build a model on one data and predict on the other data set because they disagree. And there is a lot. There are a lot of parameters that are exper the experimental protocols between those two studies are very different. So there are many many things that could go wrong. But actually, one study was nice enough to publish uh, a technical replicate. So they used the same cell line in two different sites using the same protocol, and this is the correlation they got. So in the paper, they would they would report an R squared of 0.30 something, p value 10 minus 16, and I would say, oh, everything is perfect. But when I did the scatter plot and, and look at the points, it was shocking that it was far from being perfect, at least from a 
for from a supervised learning pr perspective it's going to be it's going to be very hard so that basically tell you that the experimental protocol the biological and technical variability in those assay to generate those data is actually very large and then a, co a colleague of mine uh, uh, Andrew Beck proposed an experiment that I found extremely stupid but actually pretty cool and, and, and played a key role in, in the paper is that say so, okay here I want to enter into the details but we look at let's say we look at the correlation between a single gene expression and the AUCs and the drug sensitivity data and if you look at the two studies they kind of disagree on the on the FX size this is with all all the genes even the ones that are not significant and this is a subset with highly significant genes so here you can see that the correlation between the two studies each point being a drug is actually on average is, is pretty low with a median of slightly better than 0.2 here what we did is that we took so the study is like you have pharmacological data on both sides you have gene expression data on both sides now what we did we swapped the data so no, we didn't swap them, but we cut and paste them. So we took the genomic, the gene expression data there, cut and paste them in the other study. So we created artificially a zero noise source of gene expression data. So there is no noise in the, the gene expression data, but we kept the pharma, the drug sensitivity data as they were. It's still very messy. We did the same thing with the gene expression data from the other study. It didn't matter. Still very messy. But now we cut and paste the drug sensitivity data, data from one study to another and suddenly the correlation increased drastically right so it means that the noise doesn't really come from the gene expression data is it, it's mostly coming from those drug sensitivity data when you do it when you take a cell line and you provide the gene expression data at two different time points you, you'll get some differences for sure gene expression data is, is a it's a temporal thing there are many many factors that could affect gene expression data but the noise the, the big noise in the drug sensitivity data that's really what messing up with with all this whole biomarker discovery if you want to find genes that are associated with drug sensitivity and if you have zero noise in your drug sensitivity data then you can do a very good job so we publish our paper and then we pay the consequences because the title was pretty aggressive inconsistency in large pharmacogenic data so we got three groups actually four um, but you'll see how they managed to publish the paper later but we got three robot letters so we three we got three groups criticizing our paper um, so that was very intense on our hands because we had to defend our work so we worked in the shadow for many many uh, for actually two years to try to disprove what they've done and they've raised good points uh, but sometimes they made big mistakes so it was a lot of work and the nature editor were we were basically playing the role of reviewers and responders because we had the right to respond but each time we find a, a, a big mistake they would allow the author to revise it so it would never end right actually believe it or not they are still in the pipeline so they may they may still get published tomorrow i don't know but we collected all the feedback from the community and I have to admit we made a lot of mistakes uh, in our study and so we decided to basically package all the criticisms and try to address them one by one in a paper that we submitted to Nature as a, as a big corrigendum if you wish uh, they refused so we put it on, on BioArchive and I'll show you a few plots um, but the bottom line is that our paper attracted so much attention that we were consistently receiving emails and, and, and questions and, and positive and negative criticism. So it was it was a lot of work. Um, so what we did in our reanalysis that we tried to check the identity of the cell line. So what we didn't really leverage before is that each cell line has been profiled for the DNA. So sometimes what happens in the lab is that cell line got contaminated by a bacteria or they got contaminated by another cell line so you think this is cell line X but that it's actually bacteria Y or cell line Z so at least before doing the experiment they check the identity and actually and, and if you have 80 percent of your DNA mutations being the same then then uh, we call it like a match it, it is the same individual those cell lines come from the same individuals and we found out of a thousand cell lines we found only six that didn't match so the problem was not some kind of contamination in the cell lines. 
Then we looked at the survivor curves. What we didn't do really before, we just took the AUC published by the authors. So when we looked at the survivor curves, we found very interesting cases, like this one, where it started at 0% viability and ended up more than 150. So it looks like, first, the control is growing too fast, and second, they give sugar to the cell line because, because that cell line is super happy. So that looks like they swap the data, they reverse the order of the data or something, but obviously that could definitely create problems. This one is funny too. It looks like they messed up with the, the dilution of the drug. So they, they're supposed to test increasing concentration and it could be real, but it's very, very, very rare that a drug has such a nonlinear uh, behavior. So here they might have messed up with the drug concentration and, and randomly ordered a point or something. So we, we got rid of all those drugs, uh, all, those cell, uh, all those drug growth response curves. That represented only 3 to 6% of the data, so it was not really a big deal. Then we found those beautiful curves because they were highly consistent. Sometimes we found beautiful curves that were highly inconsistent, okay, so we got both. So we knew from there that obviously we're not going to be able to fix the problem just from a computational point of view. The data themselves seems to be uh, pretty inconsistent. Yeah. Could you say something about the technology for measuring the variability? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell a, a bit more about the assay, but there are there are a few technologies where they basically look at the amount of ATP, those molecule that serves like energy to the cells, and the idea is that cells alive generate a lot of ATP and cells dead or dying generate much less ATP so they try to assess that. Another one is actually um, staining all the DNA and and even so DNA takes a long time to, to, uh, to degrade if a cell line proliferates it creates more and more and more DNA. So those are the technologies they use to actually say from a dish they know how much cells are alive. Is it very expensive? I mean, no, um, it's not expensive, but when you do a million experiments, r triplicates will triple the price. So it's 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 a bit tricky. Um, but one of the good effects of our paper is that no, they do a lot of replicates. Um, so as I said, there are different types of drugs, and the mistake we made in our paper is that we didn't really make made any differences. We didn't really differentiate the drug that have very large effects killing a lot of the cells of different degrees versus the drug that have very little effect but only three cell lines got got sensitive and we got criticized for that and that was a very uh, uh, constructive criticize, uh, criticism. So here you can see that if a drug has a broad effect, so here you can see a lot of cell lines uh, along the axis, the correlation is kind of poor, right? So for the broad effect cell lines there is no problem with our study. We got it right. But for for the highly targeted effects where only a few cell lines are actually responding, um, and sometimes there is not even any response, right? For those cell lines, we use spearman correlation. And that was a very bad choice, actually, because you try to rank. Spearman doesn't care. It ranks the data. It doesn't really care about the scale. So you try to order those points. But in the background, it's pure noise. There is no response at all. So trying to rank those points is completely meaningless. So what they argue in their criticism is that we should have used something like Pearson that could be a bit more attracted by the outliers. So most of the time you don't want to be influenced by the outliers. But in that case, that could be a good thing. So, uh, so a drug like this would have a high Pearson correlation because of those three points. So we agree that Spearman was a bad choice for, for, for those drugs. And sometimes you have almost no data. All the cell lines are resistant, so you should not expect any correlation. There is no signal. So we didn't really differentiate that, so now we do. And if you look at the Pearson correlation, um, we don't, so before we had around 0.5, and after differentiating and using the Pearson instead of Spearman, Spearman, whatever, we didn't really get better results. So we felt confident that our paper was still correct in a way. The conclusions were, were okay. Here, we did a fun thing. We, we take the gene expression data and look at the correlation. So you take a single gene, um, and you have the cell lines for the two studies. So you do a scatter plot, you look at the correlation, and you do as, as you do for the AUC and the IC50. And basically, you can look at, you can see that the gene expression data are always more consistent than the pharmacological data. So 
for, for pharmacologists, that kind of plot doesn't make any sense. But I would say that for a machine learner, you need your input data to be consistent. You need your output data to be consistent. So I thought it was an interesting comparison. So it is the, just the way we, we, we look at the correlation. We just control for tissue type. This is the gene expression. This is the drug sensitivity. So it's just a simple linear model. <coughs> and what we didn't do in our study is that we didn't really look at non-biomarkers. Stuff that we know should be correlated with sensitivity. And I already cited the RBB2 gene expression with lapatinib, for instance, which is actually here. Okay. So here you can see the FX size in both cohorts, uh, FX size and p-value in both cohorts. And let's say we put a yes when it's when it's uh, um, consistent across the study, and and we put no when it's not. Here you can see that let's say two thirds are consistent. So it's actually pretty good news. Those data are not random. There is very strong biological signal there. Gene and Tech, another company, saw our paper and say, that's not good. That's our business. We do those screening. If someone says it's inconsistent, we're going to have to say the opposite because this is how we, we generate the data. Or it could just be that they, are, they were scientifically interested to, to compare our result with their own screen because they do it internally. And they published this very, very nice paper. And, and here, I think it's very nice because they added their own data and they, they did very, very interesting analysis. So they had their own data set, so 400 salines, 16 drugs with a big overlap with GDSC and CCLE. The only thing I have a bit of a problem uh, with that paper is that they, they try to discretize the data. So they say, oh, if the AUC is smaller than a value, it's resistant. If it's between those two boundaries, it's intermediate. And here it's, it's sensitive. And here you don't see them very well, but you see the two lines. So this is, um, I guess this is uh, resistant. This is sensitive, resistant, sen uh, sensitive, resistant. And <laughs> And when I saw that plot, my first thought is that I can do the same plot, but depending on the order of the points I plot, they will overlap and I can reach a completely different conclusion. So if you plot the cross, the crosses, after all the other points, it looks right. You could do that and make it look blue or green, right? So it's, I, f I found it a bit funny. And then they, they use percentage of agreement. So they basically count how many cell lines agreed in the quadrants. And that's very misleading because sometimes, like here, you get a big number in both quadrants, so that's fine. But sometimes you have a huge imbalance between classes. If 95% of your points are resistant, and the other study says everything is resistant, you got 95% agreement. Even so, the other study bring no information whatsoever. So they should have used something like kappa coefficient or whatever, but I won't fight anymore. Um, and so... What I found very nice in that paper is that as, as you, oh, no, it's almost the end. Okay. So to answer to your question, Gianluca, here they use different assay. So this is the assay measuring the amount of DNA. This is from the GDSC study. And this is the assay they use in G, uh, the Genentech and the Wellcome Trust Sanger uh, GDSC uh, data set. And surprisingly, they found a very decent uh, uh, correlation between the two, the two assays. And then they, they, they had this very nice heat map where you basically, I guess they took all the drugs with, with a large range of sensitivity and they used Pearson. So they said, okay, we, we'll only take the drugs where we, we know that Pearson is somehow a good metric for consistency. And then each, each cell here is a consistency between this data set and these experiments and I explain the details. The scary part of that heat map is that the three studies were extremely different. If you look at the gram, they were the least correlated across all the experiments. Here, what they showed is that they did in-house, they redid the experiment. So they used the, what they call the CTG, cell titer glio. So Genentech used the CTG, but they say, well, we're a company, we have a lot of money, we can do it exactly, we can do exactly the same thing with the, with the pharmacological assay used in GDSC. And, and the other scary point is that if you do the data internally, you're more likely to be consistent with yourself, even so you use very different technologies and very different platforms than another study. So it's not so much about the pharmacological assay. It looks like who did what matters much more than the experimental protocol. 
and I think that's that's a very informative plot. So, but you need you really need a lot of money to actually do that. And Genotech did it, and that that's awesome. So to finish on on a good note, um, this is what I published in 2013 by using the spearmint. So you can see that here, this is a drug where only a few cell lines are responding. So the spearmint is very very low. And here, those are two drugs with very large uh, spectrum of response. So the, the spearmint is a bit better, but it's, it's still not great. Then if you take the same data and use Pearson, then suddenly you see that Pearson is attracted by the few outliers, which I guess is good in that case. And here you get a little bit of a better signal, but still, it's still, still not very awesome. And then Genentech came in and said, okay, we have our own data set. And it looks like their data set resembles much more GDSC and CCLE than GDSC and CCLE together. So maybe, lucky or unlucky, depending on the point of view, we picked two data sets that seem to be very different. And Genentech generated data that's kind of right in the middle. So if you want to be, a, uh, if you want to be optimistic, you can say that, well, we got more and more data, we got data sets that agree more and more, and, and so the field is moving forward. Um, no, we can also do stuff like that. We can look at the expression of a gene, the drug sensitivity, which is the AUC, and then we can look at three data sets now. And obviously that biomarker uh, is very robust because the effect size is in the same direction, as significant in all studies, even so you, have, you might have statistical differences in the effect size, at least they're on the same, 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 same direction. Here you can see that this biomarker is not very good. Two studies seem to agree more or less, but GDSC completely disagrees with an opposite uh, direction of the biomarker. Um, so I'll go fast then. Um, the only reason why we build the R package to do those stuff is because we had to. They forced us to make our analysis extremely efficient. We had to answer to three orbital letters plus another paper. So at the end of the day, we built the PharmacoGX R package where we standardize the cell line name and we try to, to refit all the curves and everything using the same approaches. So we published that last year. Um, and, and the idea is that now we, we take all the molecular data, we take the, the drug sensitivity data, and then we put them in a, in, a, in a single R object that contains everything and make sure that everything is in sync. So every cell line has all the annotation, every drug has all the annotation, you have the gene expression for those cell lines, et etc. et cetera. You can do plenty of stuff. So now, instead of my first paper, I got like maybe 10,000 lines of code to do what I needed to do. Now I could do it with like, literally download data set, compute biomarkers, compare them. It's like three lines. Um, okay, so this is a bit of details about the package itself, but we also use ontologies for the cell line name. We use um, kind of standard nomenclature for to define drugs. Believe it or not, after 50 years of research in, in drugs and cell lines, they never agreed on an identifier. So you can call your cell lines the way you want, but the computer will not do the match uh, easily. We got all those data sets more or less done in the lab, so we release them in the community, so they can they can actually download them easily, compare them easily. And again, the goal is not to say that we're right. The goal is to say, see by yourself. And if we make any mistakes in our own curation, the way we process the data tell us, and we're going to fix it. So in conclusion, I would say it's a very hot field. You can, you can still stay in the game even if you pissed off the big players. Um, there is a big need for standardization, and we hope to accomplish that uh, through PharmacoGX. And I think now, after two years of curation, it's finally time for machine learner to take those data and try to leverage them. So a few future works, oh sorry, that was from a bioconductor conference, but we have, we have new ways to combine different molecular data. We are building a database where you can go there and say, oh, I'm interested in that drug and that cell line, tell me which data set it is, show me the curves, compare the curves, etc. So hopefully the biologists will like the, this thing. This is for, more for bioinformatician. This is more for machine learner. Know that we have like so many data sets looking at the same drugs, the same cell lines. Know you can finally. Uh, build models, validate them. Now no, it's time to really design the best method to do it. And now, uh, as Gianluca already asked, we, we have a version 2 that's coming where we have two drug combination data sets. And as you can imagine, if we cannot really predict response to a single drug, drug combination is going to be tricky. So to uh, finalize, um, I consider myself as a data vulture. 
as well as a data vampire. And more recently, we have been categorized as a research project. So who, who, who saw that uh, editorial from New England? You did? So anyway, so they said those, were, those are clinicians. And they basically say, don't share your data. They belong to us. Uh, you will never understand what, what those data means anyway. And even worse, you could take them and try to disprove what we've done. And the way, you, the way I read this is like people looking at, at data and analyzing those data independently, I call them scientists, and, and trying to disprove, I call it doing science. But anyway, uh, that's a different point of view, I guess. Um, those are the people in the lab. Um, Jale and Peter are the ones uh, dealing with PharmacoGX, and Ali Madani and Mark Freeman on the drug combination. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.